Yeah, my wife and I bought our first piece about eight years ago. We find ourselves living in this wonderful house, which has a medieval origin. Uh, and we had a lot of empty space, particularly in the chapel. Um, we started looking into medieval art, met Sam Fogg, acquired our first piece. We never really intended to build up a collection, but one thing led to another, and gradually we accumulated more and more and filled the chapel space and started filling up other rooms as well. Uh, I've always had a great interest in medieval art. I studied art history at university, and um, really you know, the interest has stayed with me throughout my life. Um, so this was a great opportunity, which I'm terrifically lucky and privileged to be able to build this collection. When, when the Van Horn collection came in the market, we were very, very excited. Um, particularly that early period, the Romanesque, um, something that really, really interested us. And when we saw the Cooney Arch, we were just bowled over. And we're very, very lucky to be able to acquire that. Cooney was founded in, in, in 910 AD on lands belonging um, to, to William, Duke of Aquitaine. And from the very start, it enjoyed uh, immunity from uh, lay and episcopal intervention. In other words, it was completely independent and answered only to the Pope in Rome. So it had a, a kind of, uh, it had, well, it had a total um, uh, papal immunity from political and uh, social intervention by the local bishop, by, and so on. And this gave it in, an enormous freedom to expand and acquire properties. As is very well known, the, the, the big church of Cluny uh, was one of the biggest edifices in Europe. It measured, I think, 610 feet long, if you can imagine such a thing. No church except perhaps Earl St. Peter's in Rome was actually longer than this, this building. Um, and it was very largely destroyed in sections um, in the years, not during the revolution, but in the years following the revolution. It became a, became a sort of quarry for local builders and uh, who bought, bought the stones from the abbey and recycled them for profit. And this happened all over France in, in many cases, particularly with, um, with um, monastic churches, uh, which were um, secularized and then sold, sold off uh, by the state. And Cluny uh, was sold off. I mean, little, I mean, uh, two sections of the abbey still survive. In fact, people always say, oh, Cluny doesn't exist anymore. It does actually exist. There's a magnificent, colossal transept arm um, which still, still survives. And it's a wonderful place to go to and a wonderful place to visit and a charming town and so on. So much of the sculpture and decoration of Cluny um, was uh, smashed up and is now in fragments. And it seemed to me very important that this should be published. And we published finally a huge volume of, of with photographs in 2011, uh, the corpus of, uh, of sculpture, uh, uh, of the sculpture of the great church at Cluny. In the course of this work on the corpus, um, a particularly an American colleague of mine, David Walsh, did wonderful work. And we, we smelt out um, a large, large, large number of fragments, very similar to the one which I found here in Sam's gallery. Um, and, uh, and something like a hundred uh, fragments before you say, oh, well, then it's a commonplace thing. There's no particular interest in this thing. This is one of the best preserved and one of the most richly decorated of that hundred or so fragments of an ensemble. And the ensemble was um, the choir screen. The choir screen, uh, 
from the time of the Gregorian reform in the second half of the 11th century onwards, uh, the monastic communities began to, to require um, and insist on privacy within their um, opus dei, within their services, within the daily round of services, which took place almost non-stop through the 24 hours of every day. Abbot Pontius of Melgoi, um, um, a very great abbot indeed, a very remarkable man, very controversial, who actually fell from grace in 1122-1123 um, and, and ended up in, in abject misery in Rome. But he was in his period from 1109 until 11, the early 1120s, was one of the great ecclesiastics of Europe. And in referring to Pontius, in this life of his predecessor, St. Hugh, who had nominated Pontius as his successor, uh, it said that Pontius had recreated and rebuilt a new choir for the monks at Cluny. So that must be the choir of which this was part of the enclosure so it must date from before 1120 to 1121. It's very richly decorated with beautiful ornament. The, the reverse of this, because it could be seen from two sides, the reverse of this is much plainer. And that's for the good reason that the monks wouldn't have seen it because they would have been sitting in their stalls inside the choir and would have looked up and would have seen this, this beautiful choir barrier. And the other thing to say is, I don't know whether you can just see that in the middle of the pearls, running along the top, there's an iron hook, and that would have been for the suspension of textiles to shut off the open arch, which is underneath, to keep um, busy visitors who were wandering around in the choir aisles during services from seeing the monks um, at their orisons inside. Anyway, this is a beautiful and, and very, very important um, piece of, of Romanesque uh, liturgical furniture, very, very important. Historically, the reason why the Cluny uh, choir barrier is so important is that David Walsh, this American colleague of mine who worked on, on the fragments, was able to prove beyond any shadow of doubt that the choir barrier was very high. That is to say that it must have gone up above the choir stalls, which were in several levels, because there were lots of monks at Cluny. And then above that ran this beautiful uh, carved choir enclosure screen of arches, open arches, sharp arches, open and so on. Um, why is that historically important? Because um, if you read any book on Gothic architecture, Gothic architecture, you'll see that they say that the choir barrier, the jube, the choir screen, was a Gothic invention of the late 12th century. That is not so. And at Cluny, we were able to prove that already before 1120, in the Romanesque period, the high barricade keeping the monks away from the curious eyes of the faithful uh, was already in place. This major element of what in, in the Gothic period becomes a very important feature was already perfectly established in the early, at least in the early 12th century. I expect it's probably earlier, but the earliest example we have so far, which can be proved to be a high choir enclosure, is a puny. So this is a very important historical document.